I introduce our next speaker, I want to make an example how the Academy gives you, um, opens doors to meet new friends, to gain more knowledge, and what have you. So before I introduce my next, our next speaker and my friend, uh, I think it was two years ago, we were here and uh, I was sharing um, some vodka with the Minings, and uh, he said, Chris, have you ever seen these books? And I said, what books are these? And he said, well, these books, and he showed me some books that Dr. Shackman had done on the works of Dr. Rose and I. said, I'd never seen this stuff before. How can I get copies of this? Well, next thing I know, I'm doing cavitations on this gentleman. He's living in my house, and we're writing books together, and he's publishing his books on Rose and I. So uh, I want to introduce uh, our next speaker. His name is Hal Shackman. I call him Shack for short. He has served in program analysis, consulting, and management capabilities on health, medical, and related programs for several government and private organizations, including the United States Department of State's Agency for International Development. I wonder how much of our tax dollars went to that one. The U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity, there's a dichotomy, the U.S. <laughs> Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Alaska and Washington State, uh, parentheses, nutrition programs for the elderly, comma, the Pathfinder Fund, uh, the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, uh, no relationship to bedroom sports with the new president, I guess, and the National Collegiate Athletic Association. His work has appeared in USA Today, Nature, and numerous other publications. Not only does he know things about what we do, and he teach us, but he's also an amateur physicist and has written several articles on, um, let's put, put this way, stuff way over my head. So without further ado, I want to introduce my friend, S. Hale Shackman. <laughs> Validation of the principle of focal infection. Thanks, Hus. Very looks dis distinguished today. Get you wired up here. Your government paid for this suit. I know. Okay, here's your clicker. Uh, Great. I won't. Uh, we actually won't need that. You need a laser pointer? No, because I'm not. Okay. We don't have any. Uh, okay. All right, you're on your own. Any things here? No slides. No slides today. Thank you, Dr. Husser. Uh, I would like to um, congratulate you all for being here today. I. I'm here by, <clears throat> by an incredible um, set of circumstantial accidents. And um, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Meinig, Dr. Husser, and Dr. Rana for, uh, for bringing me here. I, it's um, interesting, the way that I met, uh, the, 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 I met Dr., um, uh, Dr. Meinig via the telephone. He called me up. Um, I had. I was trying to get a root canal done by USC, and, I, and I, they, they wouldn't do it for me, and so I tried to put them on record by emailing them, and somehow the detailed email that I sent to them ended up getting to Dr. Meinig, and, and I have to compliment his intellectual curiosity. He called up and wanted to find out what this was all about, and, this, um, and as a result, of, of that, then he introduced me to Dr. Husser and he to Dr. Arana. So if you find something of value in what I say here today, um, uh, you can uh, thank them. If you don't like what I say today, you can blame them. Um, anyway, we're, we're pleased to be here. The, um, I wanted to just start out with a, with a, couple, of, uh, a couple of things that are not specifically germane to the, to the question of focal infection, but they're things that, that have, um, in one case, it's come up quite a bit today. And, um, and this is my earlier uh, research, which is on hydration. And for more information on that, you can find this on the internet at, at hydration.com. Um, and this is a project that I've been involved with since 1982. Uh, and w there's been mention today of the Wheatstone Bridge, of, of uh, ions, of, of uh, 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 specific gravities, pH, and so on. 
And these things all involve solutes and aqueous solution. Now, this is a little technical, and like I say, I, I don't want to confuse this with the other, but I think it's important to know that there is a methodology that's being totally ignored, much more so ignored than, than Rosenau's work and so on, that was proposed in 1932 that is based on, on, a, on a very strict measurement of the behavior of ions in solution, which is the conductivities of ions. We know the Wheatstone Bridge is a very precise instrument. It measures the velocities of ions. And a gentleman in 1932, Lewis Herrick Flint, was able, he's the first one and the only one, I've searched literature very thoroughly for several years until I got trapped by Rosenau, and Flint used the Wheatstone Bridge as a scale to weigh solute ions. There's still a big mystery in, in science, in physics, chemistry, and biology of, of some confusion that there is no, we don't know the hydration number. We dissolve things in water, but we don't know how many ions attach to them. Well, Flint was able to calculate it directly. He showed that the Wheatstone Bridge is, it's a balanced device. It, precisely measures these things. And one of the things that measure, you can just translate these velocity measurements into weight measurements. So we know exactly what's happening on the ionic level with water. At least we have the foundation for understanding this. The impl implications of this are, are absolutely astounding because everything we eat either goes into a cell or does not go into a cell through osmotic force. And we, at the present time, we have no real means of understanding this. Flint's method um, it, it, the, the, the system he, he, he discovered is algebraic, it's very simple, and, and it's really, it's, it's, it's an extension of the law of gra gravitation down to the ionic level. Its significance is, is mind-boggling. There's no question that, uh, to my mind, and I, this is what kept me on this since 1982, and I'm returning back to the study of it, is that there, the, the, uh, when we have a full understanding of these, the, the mechanics that moves an ion in, into and outside of a cell, then we will eventually be able to reverse those procedures. And Flint's work makes it, uh, up to this point, we've thought that maybe it's possible someday, you know, you see these science fiction things, that someday we'll be able to reverse these processes, these metabolic processes. Flint's work makes it inevitable. There's no question. All of these processes, it's not, not in our lifetime, but we now have the tool to do it. So this is a very, for anyone that's concerned, that's interested in pH, to, to start to begin to understand what it is, to start to understand what ions are, what aqueous solutions are. Uh, th this is just the basic foundation, but um, I would recommend that, that we start to look into Flint's works, and I have some, some, some of the work that I've done on this, uh, a number of 20 abstracts and, a, and an example of direct calculation from conductance to the hydration number. And when you start the osmolality, specific gravity, all of these things, we go directly there from the atomic number with this methodology. And it's, it's not theoretical. It is first in the first instance based on a measurement. So I'll stop there with hydration. Now, I, I, I but in, indirectly, hydration brought, brought me here because I was, I met a gentleman in San Francisco and, and, uh, and we were doing some other work and he, I was unable, unable to work with him during the day and because and I, I said, I've got my science project. And he told me about this, well, he, he tried to solicit, to get me to, to help him with this concept that he had been involved with when he was a, when he was a child. His, he, he was a, Jap, a, a, a Filipino, and when the Japanese invaded uh, the Philippines, he and his father, who was a doctor, he was 14 years old, his father was 65, and they took off for the mountains of, of uh, Papanga province. Uh, all the men had to, had to take off. And after a few months, they ran out of quinine, and his father said, okay, now we're gonna start drawing blood. And so they took out uh, 10 cc's of blood, put it in a culture dish and swirled it around and re-injected it into the buttocks muscle of about 40 people. And he said, I cured, we cured all these people of their malaria. And I said, Bert, I'm just not into this kind of stuff. I'm dealing with real solid science. But, but he, he told me about this a few times. And so I looked into it a little bit. And, and lo and behold, at some point, I found that there was a huge field uh, called autohemotherapy that, again, no one was paying attention to and found about a thousand articles that were written. They were buried under serum therapy, but a thousand articles that were written mostly in the first half of this century. Um, autohemotherapy formally is about a hundred years old, and, and, and there were all these articles where this reinjection of blood intramuscularly primarily was, had, had supposedly cured all of these diseases. So, uh, while I was looking into this autohemotherapy, I 
had come across, I thought, first I thought it was a vaccine, type of vaccine, because I couldn't find anything on the literature, in the literature on it. And while looking into vaccine therapy, I came across this Dr. Edward C. Rosenau, who in 1915 was being praised for having revolutionized medicine. And he was, he was being talked about in an article in the, in the same breath of Koch and Ehrlich and Rosenau and being credited with perfecting autogenous vaccines. And I was saying, wait a minute, Rosenau, that was Sir Almuth Wright. He, we, everybody knows Sir Almuth Wright. He was the hero in uh, Bernard Shaw's uh, book, uh, Doctor's Dilemma. And uh, he was the, the model for uh, Ridgen, who was the hero of that, and uh, talked about opsonins, and really was the inventor of autogenous vaccines. And I'm trying to say, now, why are they ignoring Wright and they're paying attention to this Rosenau? And so at this point, I was pretty firmly impressed with the work of Sir Almuth Wright, and I initially went after Dr. Rosenau to, to say, well, th there's something's wrong here. There, this guy couldn't possibly be this important. And then that was in 1988, maybe early 89, and Dr. Rosenau uh, took up several years of my life, as I mentioned uh, uh, last year. And so it turns out, and so I, at first I was going to use Dr. Rosenau, and I, when I really got into his work, I saw he was such a good scientist with the Mayo Foundation for 30 years and worked with these other people for so long. And I, I just, I, I, I looked at the literature, found he was in the, in the medical literature from 1902 to 1958. I thought there were some other Rosenaus, and there are two other E.C. Rosenaus that followed him, but this was all his work. Um, Edward C. Rosenau from 1902 to 1958 in the, in the medical literature. And take a two minutes here. So at first, at first I was going to use Dr. Rosenau because he, he also, he showed how the organism that causes the wide range of diseases actually is in the blood. He used these refined culture techniques. So I said, oh, very easy. I'm just going to write my little book on autohemotherapy and I'll bring in from the side Dr. Rosenau because he proves that there's an organism in the blood. So autohemotherapy probably is a vaccine. But we couldn't leave it there and, and uh, taking, you know, you, Dr. Rosenau repeatedly was saying where the organism was coming from. And I tried to close my eyes to it, but he, he kept saying it's coming from the teeth or tonsils. Tonsils or teeth, tonsils or teeth. <laughs> and so this required that we look a little bit more into Dr. Rosenau's work. And, and uh, specifically, I, was, uh, I expected to find something that would refute Dr. Rosenau. And, and the thorough search of the medical literature and the dental literature, there was, there was really nothing that I was able to, to, to put a finger on. And finally, I was tracing, going back to this one particular article that was written by a W. H. Holman, and I thought that was cited as being having statistically refuted Rosenau's work, and it was it was a, it was a total sham. So what what we'll do is, um, and I want to just show you very briefly, just why that how that work was deficient in your in your little blue uh, packages here. You have a. Da, 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 uh, Institute of Science, and it says fraud in medicine, doctoring the numbers. And I'll just ask you to turn to the third page there, which is a, a table where I have a comparison of Dr. Rosenau's and Dr. Holman's data. And, it's, it, um, and, and then following that, there are two pages which shows the actual data, and you'll be able to see this more, and it's explained in this material. But I just, if you could look at that, and you can see on this uh, table one, it says injection into lab animals, and there's a, uh, an area that's circled. And on the right side of that circle, there's a 48% and 52% figures. What Holman said is, Rosenau didn't prove anything. Half of the animals that got stomach ulcers, half of them, the injection, the organism came from people with stomach ulcers, and half came from people that didn't have stomach ulcers. So Rosenau didn't prove anything. Well. That is a cor correct statement that, that half of them did come from one and half came from the other. But as you, if you look to the left there, you see it's 62 versus 68. Well, that's 62 out of 103 got terrible stomach ulcers, whereas 68 out of 405 got stomach ulcers that weren't as, as bad, but he, Rosenau counted them. So in this case, it was really four times as likely that the organism came from somebody with stomach ulcers. Basically, what Rosenau did is he fulfilled Cox postulates. 
He took the organism from a person with a disease, injected it into laboratory animals, and then he, he if you look at the detail, you can uh, the detail that follows this, you can see he then took the organism from the animal and then injected it into another series of laboratory animals. That's a Cox postulates. That is that proves the causation of disease. By 1915, Rosenau had proved the causation of a wide range of diseases, and this is why he was everyone was saying he revolutionized medicine. Now, Rosenau's work was featured in Frank Billings' book. Focal infection, which Billings was the president of the AMA in 1902. He's considered the father of American medical education. And from 1902 to 1915, he spent his full time working on the concept of focal infection and, and got a group of people with him, Ludwig Hectoen, and Rosenau was the baby of the group. And Rosenau did the bacteriological work, but several other investigators confirmed Rosenau's work. And uh, so this, this was considered by Billings the high point of, of his career. Now, getting nervous. Okay, this, 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 this table here um, is, is an example of, this is, the, what, what, what happened then though is, in, this is, this is Holman's, Holman did about several hundred calculations and devise this, this table, which consists of only the last two columns of that table one that I've just been discussing. He ignored all of the other information that showed how many animals were injected and so on. So it was, it was just a totally bogus presentation of what Rosenau's data really showed. It really showed that, that he fulfilled Cox postulates. But now the problem is, is that in the 30s, there were a number of people, and, and this, is, this is where the, the, uh, the, the, I guess it happens in a lot of disciplines where you will find some information that backs your position and, and use that information, and this is exactly what happened in dentistry. All of the pioneer endodontists started to refer to this work of Holman as having refuted Rosenau because the implication of Rosenau's work, they all knew that if, if you accept Rosenau's work, you can't, you can't do root canals and you've got a real problem doing dentistry at all. And so finally now, here there, here's Holman who was a fairly well-known bacteriologist and he said Rosenau's work is not conclusive. So one Blaney, Appleton, Coolidge, uh, all of them, one would refer to him and then others would refer to them and to Holman and so on. And if you look at the literature, the foundational literature of, of, of endodontics, Grossman as well particularly, uh, they all prominently cite Holman as having refuted Rosenau or they cite each other in terms of, and, and the other one had cited Holman as having refuted Rosenau. There's nothing there. The whole literature falls apart. Um, but it's not just um, the Holman, uh, so, so that's, that's one real big, big, big problem, but the, it, it's not just Holman, it's, there, there's a certain pre, predisposition to, 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 to cite things that, uh, uh, it, and it's particularly evident in, in dentistry, uh, that certain uh, articles or parts of articles are cited uh, Grossman did this on, on, uh, on a number of occasions where he would cite one little paragraph of an article which basically said, we could all, uh, give you a prime example, he cites uh, 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 Hayden in, his, in, in, in several volumes from 1940 to 1990, Hayden is cited uh, as having done the definitive bacteriological work on, on, uh, on root canals. Well, if you go to Hayden's work, you find that he says root, you can't do them. So, so that we have some partial references here that are incorrect, that are, that are inundating the literature. And one thing that I wanted to mention today, am I too loud or too, is that about right? Okay. Because I, well, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to mention this one, there's a, there's a Cecil and Angevine article in 1938 that I, I saw on the British Dental Association's uh, web page as having refuted Rosenau. And I, and, and others have, have referred to it. And I want to take took another look at the Cecil and Angevine article. And it's, it's prominently cited because Cecil was a co-worker at one point. And so that this is shown as, well, here's someone that had, had worked and supported the Rosenau position, and now he reversed his position. Well, if you go to that Cecil and Angevine article, it, it is not really a refutation. It's not really a turnaround. It's a retrospective article that was written by Angevine 
who was angivine was trying to prove that you can't put a focus, start a focus in the skin. Most of the article is retrospective, and, and apparently, I, I, you know, Angevine went through all of Cecil's records for the previous six years, and, he's, and, he, and he went through his medical, Cecil was a, was a medical doctor treating people with, with rheumatism, and he went through his records and he said that, um, well, there were all these people, uh, th there was no evidence of needing any dental work except for three, so they all had perfect teeth, but they also had arthritis, so that was, that was the, uh, most of the article's retrospective. It says there's no connection because they, they, they had good teeth there when they had arthritis, so therefore there is no connection. And then the, the, the last part of the article where he took some organisms and injected it in different foci, including the tonsils, he did not get a, an infection from from injecting it in places other than the tonsils, but when he injected in, in the tonsils, he did get a focus of infection. So if anything, the Cecil, Cecil and Angevine article really supports this, this position. So I would urge you, if anyone is, comes up with, a, some, with something that, that says that they have refuted Rosenau, that you suggest that they read the article or get you a copy of the article, and you will find that there's, there, there really is very little. There, there's nothing there that's refuted this position. And now the, the significance of this is that there is such a tremendous body of work that's been done on this. By 1915, Rosenau, as I said, was already being talked about as having revolutionized medicine. He went on for 30 years with the Mayo Foundation and, and beyond Cox postulates used agglutination tests, precipitation tests, skin tests, all types of other tests to prove every which way to Sunday that all of these various systemic diseases that we consider mysterious, they are caused by an organism that emanates from, from oral focus. And it's, it's primarily the streptococcus. I want to get... Um, I want to focus on, on some of the things that Martin Fisher, uh, uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, Dr. Uh, Arana gave me a copy of the book, Martin Fisher's Death and Dentistry. And this is something that um, uh, everybody, everybody ought to read. Uh, I have a couple of pages on that, an overall review and assessment, and on the back side are, are some of the highlights of what Fisher talked about of signs to look for in teeth, even in teeth that have never been dentistry uh, and signs to uh, look for in, in tonsils. Uh, the Fisher book is, a, is, Fisher was a physiologist from the University of Cincinnati. He wrote the book Death and Dentistry in 1940. It's based on articles that he had written from 1915 and 1922, plus other articles subsequently. And the, the, the book is, is a huge endorsement of the billings rosenau syndrome. I'll give you a minute to, to find that. Fisher approached this problem from the perspective of a physiologist. And, and he, comes, he comes right out and emphasizes that uh, and Fisher gave the, gave the data as, uh, he says, most, most foci our oral foci. He said 99% plus and suggested that it was unfortunate that, that Billings said that some, the, not all, most are, are oral foci, but some, some foci are from other places. And Fisher emphasized that, that it was 99% of foci were from, uh, from the teeth or from the tonsils. If we can just drop back for a minute, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about Fisher, but I just wanted to touch on a couple of historical things that even go further back. There is a book that Hippocrates wrote, it's called Dentition, and Jones, who was a translator of that, he said, he, he, he said, I'm, I may be wrong, but I think that there's a mistake here. These things don't go together, because in Dentition, Hippocrates was talking about teething, and he was talking about tonsils. And Jones said, these are two separate things. One thing has nothing to do with another. Well, may, maybe they do. Um, childhood diseases tend to come from tonsils, according to Fisher and so on. And, and teething is a very difficult life in the time of children. So that I, I think the interpretation may easily be made that this is basically what Hi Hippocrates was talking about, was that these, he, this is 
this is the one book that is totally dedicated to oral focal infections, and it's one of the, one of the uh, ignored books of uh, Hippocrates. I uh, just wanted to mention that, and then is John Hunter, and this Fisher mentions John Hunter in his book, uh, who is the father of anatomy, and Hunter talked about the jawbone and the tooth bones as being part of one complex. It's one, one, uh, one unit. So when you have an infection in one, you have an infection in the other. It's, 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 it's part of a unit. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, Benjamin Rush, who was the, was in the one, a signer of the uh, Declaration of Independence, his reputation was made by, by um, uh, forcing, by having some arthritics uh, have, their, have their teeth pulled. And then all of these people who were crippled, who could not walk, uh, were able to walk, and he became known as the greatest physician of his time. Um, even uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, if I, I, some of my words I pronounce incorrectly, but I, I, I'm, I'm doing the best to present my interpretation of, of Fisher's and these other people's works. Um, Austin Flint, uh, in 1868, he was also president of the AMA, and he talked about how this was a condition that was caused, in some cases, by curious teeth. Um, and then, of course, there was William Hunter in 1900 who made a real big splash, um, both in England and here, who was first uh, talking about the uh, concept of, he called it, oral sepsis. I had something here of, uh, uh, and now again, if you look in some of the um, dental books, uh, 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 endodontics books, I, I've seen comments that say, well, Hunter wasn't talking about decayed teeth. Hunter was talking about the bridges that capture the filth. Well, here, 1900, uh, William Hunter, uh, he says, he says, uh, he calls for the removal of all diseased, useless stumps. I mean, it's just about as plain as you can get. He also was talking about the bridges as well, but he was talking about the diseased teeth. And Hunter, in 1900, said, no pus organisms are so virulent as those grown in connection with necrosing bone. Uh, Fisher makes quite a case of, uh, this, this, is, this is Hunter in 1900. Now, in 1940, Fisher makes quite a case of the tooth being a bone and that caries is necrosing bone. So that not only do we, we, are we talking about a, a, an infection, we're talking about the worst kind of infection that is known, at least that's 100 years ago, that's what, what, um, what, what, what some of the best respected people felt. So that not only is it a question of whether teeth re are, once they get caries, whether this is infected bone, but it's the worst type of infection that, they can, that we can have. I just wanted to mention just those things briefly. And now I want to um, <coughs> go on to Dr. Fisher, and we'll uh, go through some of the some of the points there. Oh, just just one other thing here. Um, I see ulcer cited as the latest ailment uh, for Yeltsin. Uh, another one of the you know ulcers is one one thing that a couple years ago. And now the, the regimen for, for stomach ulcers is, uh, is antibiotics um, a, a, a instead, of, instead of surgery. They're more and more moving, moving toward that. Well, you hear that in the news, but what you don't hear is that, that this organism has been linked to oral foci. Well, Rosenau showed this in 1915, and it's finally coming back around but that the source of the organism is from oral foci. So the one problem is that if, you're, if you have a stomach ulcer and you're taking these antibiotics, just be aware that you may be helping the organism. It just changes it over to another form, and it may show up in some other. You haven't rid yourself totally of the organism as long as you have that oral focus. So um, which, which brings us to another point here, the question of the immune system and autoimmune diseases and so on. All the diseases that are currently considered autoimmune diseases are diseases which long before Rosenau showed there's a bacterial cause. The autoimmune concept came out of the 30s to try to explain um, encephalitis and multiple sclerosis, and the concept was developed in an absence of people referring to Rosenau's work. Now, um, Rosenau did refer in one of his articles around that time to, he was trying to explain what might be occurring here is that when you have, when you have the bacterial infection that your own autogenous tissues get 
get involved. And so what you're seeing is a complex of the organism or the infection and the autogenous tissue. But without the organism, you don't have the disease. And some of the literature, the current literature on, on autoimmune disease is coming back around and saying, yeah, but there must be something else. Well, it's basically admitting that there's no such thing as autoimmune disease. The problem with the concept of autoimmune disease is like it's, it's in a sense, it's, a, it's, it's kind of an arrogant concept. It's like, well, we can't find what's causing it, so it, the body must be causing it itself. And um, I don't know. It's, um, uh, but what the, the problem being is that our current concept of the immune system is, is, has so evolved from, uh, well, Yvonne Roy was one of the founders of, of what we consider the autoimmune concept, and, and he's also written some key books on immunology, and a lot of our, our thoughts about immunology are traced back to this concept, but if you know a bacterial cause, then you don't need to say that, that it's the body turning on itself. So what we, what we if, I think it's a bogus concept. You don't really need it because we know there's some other cause. So the, the, there, there, there's a difficulty here. And we have other things that have developed since uh, Rosenau's work has fallen into disfavor that are trying to explain some of these same things. And, I, and again, I, I want to applaud, applaud um, uh, many of the people, some here, some that, that are not here, that have written and, and that know that there's something wrong in that oral focus. It's the teeth or the tonsils. We know that, so we're trying to figure out what it is. But I, I want to caution against reinventing the wheel if we, we have this, this huge amount of work. It's like I say, Rosie and I was back with the Mayo Clinic for 30 years after that, after working with Billings, and another 15 years he worked on his own and really carried this stuff. He, he didn't find all of the answers. But he did take us a long way down that road to really getting a grip on, on human disease. And um, if, we could, if we could somehow communicate this, educate people, and use that as the starting position, then we can, we can make such, a, such an incredible change in, uh, in, in the situation in, in, in record time. I want to run down some of the main things here that are discussed in, in Fisher's uh, book, Death and Dentistry. And um, because the book is out of, out of print, Dr. Arana um, and Mrs. Arana have, have made, it, made it available, and I'm encouraging them to do so. And I encourage everyone to order a copy, or if not, go to your library. I found um, they've got a couple copies at the UCLA Library in Los Angeles. Um, most medical uh, libraries will have it. It's an incredible book. Fisher was a physiologist. He worked with these guys in 19, from 1915 on, and he summarizes all of his own work, uh, as well as the works of, of Billings, Rosenau, and all of their associates. Gives some very interesting history. He talks about how, how Billings, actually from the 18, late 1800s, Billings was pushing the concept of oral focal infection, but he didn't start to write about it until the early 1900s. All right, teeth and tonsils. The entire diagram of primary foci is the tonsils and teeth. And this is like emphasized again and again and again by Fisher. Now, one thing that's been a little bit confusing, I was talking to Dr. Husser about this um, in one of the earlier breaks, is that Rosenau at points, he emphasized, he was saying tonsils first and then teeth. But in other places, we find reference to, well, if the tonsils are inflamed and the teeth are a problem, get rid of the infected teeth first because it starts there, then it spreads to the tonsils. <coughs> And one thing, um, what, what Fisher uh, emphasized here is that most tonsillar infections are, are a failure. Um, he said here that 73% of tonsils operations are unsuccessful. Um, and and there have been various studies, and they're, they're discussed in Fisher's book on this. And what, what, what happens is that the, the, the person is left in a worse position than they were before. So that what we have, the reason that I, I believe that Rosenau found, saw, thought, saw that tonsils were fir the first thing uh, more common than even teeth infections is because a lot of people had their, everyone was having their tonsils taken out and these were not well done operations. So that um, we have both problems. We need to be aware of both the tonsils and the teeth. And, um, 
and also for the, for this same reason now Fisher also em emphasized that when you that the uh, he came right out and said that that he he has not um, seen an extraction that has not left uh, jawbone residual jawbone infection we're going to get on here um, I can give you the exact uh, it's here this is he says um, Fisher said that uh, too frequently a tonsil or a shave a tonsil shaved or uh, peritonsillar infected lymph channels and inflamed scar tissue is not removed a tooth extracted but it's adjacent and similarly effective alveolar bone left standing too frequently excite constitutional reactions compared to which with which the signs and symptoms that made the victim a patient were trifling. In other words, just makes it makes it worse off. Um, okay, we'll go on here. The, the, uh, again, again, Fisher emphasizes from a physiological standpoint, the tooth is a bone, and um, uh, it, it's a bone. It, it might even be likened to. I, I, I'm using the analogy that just as your your tooth is connected to your jawbone by a very typical synovial joint, the same joint as that connects this finger to the rest of your, your hand. This joint and the tooth, the joint between the tooth and the jawbone, it's the same kind of joint. So once your, once your tooth gets infected and the organism gets down through, goes through the apex of the tooth, you're starting to infect a joint. And this is not a very strong organism. It takes a long time for it to, to really cause its damage, but that's why 20, 30 years down the line, people get arthritis, because that joint was infected. And Fisher says, like organisms, they like the same kind of tissue. So now you've got something growing here, so it finds other tissue to infect elsewhere in the body. And, and then, of course, then it goes down into, into the, the rest of your, uh, the rest of the jawbone and, and, and causes chronic jawbone infections. So this is, this is the concept here that we have to really start to think about. If the tooth is really a bone, uh, then, then cleaning out the root canal and it is, is, is like taking the marrow out of a bone. And that's what Fisher says. It's like, like taking the bone marrow out of a bone. And it's bone death. And uh, in, uh, let's see here. Yeah, whether uh, Fisher says uh, to devitalize means to rob a tooth of its life. Whether we call a dead bone a dead root or devitalized tooth or what will you, the problem's the same. We need to get rid of these as dead bone elsewhere in the body, and then the infection will usually take care of itself. So what Fisher emphasizes is that if we can't be calling one part of the anatomy something, and then when we get to the mouth, we call it something else and give it another name and say it has different qualities. If it's, if it's a bone, a, a, a bone in the mouth is the same as a bone someplace else. Um, if a certain procedure is wrong in principle when invoked for surgical purposes anywhere in the body, it must be equally wrong when we try to fit this problem to the teeth. So that's, that's important. Now the details of examination, I put all those on this sheet here. I we didn't want to. So those you can go over at your, at your leisure and uh, just make sure everybody that you have one of these. And, and this is everything that I saw that was the most important things. I wouldn't say it's like everything, but it's the most important things of where Fisher, it says Martin Fisher, Death and Dentistry is just one page and one page and the, and the backside. And these are what he was talking about, things to look for in teeth, signs of infection, and also to look for in tonsils. And, and it was just what um, Mrs. Issel said. He, said. he said, beware of tonsils, beware of shrunken, rind-like, normally atrophic tonsils. Uh, uh, these, these are, uh, sometimes we think that they're normally uh, atrophic, but they're not. He said, these are infected. Look for ones that are smaller and firmer than normal, from which greenish, greenish pus is expressible. So, and then on the teeth, this is a, a real uh, shocker, getting back to the teeth. Uh, Fisher just said, uh, fillings, filling, all fillings are bad. He said, what, they, what happens with a filling is that you eliminate the possibility of the cavity healing. You seal off the oxygen so the cavity can't heal. And, and the, the analogy, and I'm not sure if it's a good one or a bad one, but if, if, if we liken the finger, this last bone on the finger to the tooth bone, and we liken and I'm using this as Fisher's analogy of the, the, he used a hoof, but basically it's a fingernail, it's the same thing, that the fingernail is akin to the enamel. 
So if we go, if we have an infection in there, the fingernail gets infected, and we drill out that infection, and it goes down into the into the bone itself. And we drill all that out. You know, maybe it'll heal. But if we fill it up with something, it's not going to heal. Of course, if we fill it with mercury, we're we're we are really performing quackery. That's quackery defined. Quackery, as everybody knows, that the term came from from Quicksilver, from the Quacksalvers, and they just put mercury out of the skin. And for that, they were labeled quacks and the laughing stock of the history of medicine. Now we've got people that are putting mercury, not only just putting it on the surface, but sticking it in there permanently. That's worse than any of these the historical quacks uh, have ever uh, contemplated. So, so, but the question is, is, is there anything that we can do if we have cleaned out this infection here in this bone or this bone, is there anything we can put in there? And the Fisher's position on this is, is sadly negative. He says, I wish there was something we can do, but we don't have that means now. We don't know, we still don't know how to cure a tooth in place. Putting a filling in, even if it's uh, totally, totally inert, that is not going to heal it. Fisher said the only thing that we can do in these cases, we can clean it out as best we can, a superficial one that's not going too far in. If we can clean it out, flush it with very strong salts. Because he, he talked about salt, like the purpose of a, dent, a dentifrice being to dehydrate the area. And that's why you want to use very strong salts to, to keep the area dehydrated so that, that deprives the bacteria of the hydration that they need to survive. And then get it to where it will gloss over then you have a new, newly forming enamel, and then you can build up on that. Now, that's Fisher said that's, that's our, our only hope. Now, whether that is going to possibly work in an age where we're living on a diet of white flour and sugar, which is causing the problem in the first instance, as Dr. Meinig and Dr. Price are, are emphasizing in their talks, um, I mean, to really work, you've got, got to really cut out white flour and sugar and keep the area really clean and flush it regularly with these strong salts. Maybe then it'll gloss over, we've got a new enamel, then you can build a restoration on top of it. But beyond that, Fisher was not very hopeful. He said, we, were not th we weren't there in 1940, and I, I don't think we're there in 1999. But where we are is that we know that the organism that grows in these places does cause all these mysterious diseases. So that's, uh, that's a plus side. Um, what Fisher, Fisher emphasized all caries is osteomyelitis or osteitis. And all pyrrhea is arthritis or synovitis. It's if, if, if an infection of a, of, a, of a bone is osteomyelitis, anywhere in the body it's the same with the tooth. And if an infection of a joint is, is arthritis, anywhere in the body it's the same with the synovial membrane. It's arthritis. And, and he cautioned about how surgeons will never go in and scrape these things and so on. You're very cautious when you're operating on on, on a synovial membrane, and yet we have in, in, in dentistry, we don't have that degree. Not everybody, I'm de you know, but, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terribly difficult problem because uh, this is something that, that uh, has, has very grave implications, and, and, and Fisher talked about this to, to a great extent. Again and again, he referred, he, he, he returned to the problem of jawbone infections. And uh, there, uh, where he would, he would take the teeth out, he would do a part, jawbone, clean out the jawbone as best he could, and he found he had to go back in. And when he went back in and he, and he took the walls off and cleaned it down to a smooth arch, the patient invariably recovered. So um, a lot of emphasis on jawbone infection. So there is a lot of historical information that that supports the, the, the work that's being done now on cavitations. It's not something that's new. Uh, there is a wealth of historical information that supports the good work that's being done now. Um, emphasize, he emphasized that sinus infections are secondary to jaw and tooth infections. I have a nephew, he had a sinus infection. He's, I was trying to tell him to get rid of that root canal that he had and now it's spread to his sinus. He had a sinus infection, he's lost his sense of smell. Doesn't make any sense, you know? Get rid of the tooth. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's too bad that we are, we are still not at the point historically, developmentally, where we know what to do with a tooth once it has become compromised. But the positive news is 
we know where all these diseases are coming from. So the potential of really extending a lifespan tremendously if we can get rid of all of these oral infections, all of these diseases that are coming from this Billings-Rosenau syndrome, which is uh, it's, uh, Billings-Rosenau syndrome, it's, it's all of these diseases, all of these mysterious ones, then we've done quite a bit in terms of, of, um, of extending the, the lifespan. Uh, one of the real things that what Fisher really um, added here that was big news to me and opened my eyes is he maintained the position that after age 50 or 60, because, and he didn't talk about it so much about what, what it, the causes of it, but the fact of the matter is that most teeth in older people, he said, they have to go. Even teeth that have never been dentistry, and the ones that are never dentistry, he thought were sometimes even worse. And some of the um, reasons are explained on the back of the sheet that I, that I have there. It's um, that the, the polishing and biting surfaces have been ground down so that you're into the dent or the junction between the tooth and the gum, so you're into the gum. And the signs are loss of translucency, slight recessions, firmer fixation, uh, and so on. Um, this was, a, was a, shock, a shocker, but it's something to, to think about. And we need to, to do some, some, have some good testing to find out, um, to, to validate this or to somehow refute this, because it, it just, it, 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 it seemed to make, make some sense. And, I, um, and he was talking about a moist versus a dry form of infection, the moist form uh, being more evident, the dry forms being that which you really just, it, it's not that obvious. Um, on, uh, oh, I want to emphasize the streptococcus, that it's, the, it's, it's uh, uh, particularly Fisher emphasized it, but we see it in Rosenau's work, that there are other organisms that are growing in the oral foci, uh, a, a range, a range of, of, of organisms, and, and Fisher emphasized that these may prepare the bed, they prepare the, 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 the focus for infection by the streptococcus, but it is the streptococcus that's causing these distant diseases. And, he, and that's both because you, you, you find the streptococcus in both places, but even more specifically, we know that because Rosenau cultured this streptococcus, only the streptococcus, and with the streptococcus, he caused all these different diseases. So I think that's very important, and, and what, what also uh, Fisher specifically mentions, heavy metals. Um, and it, that this predisposes to poisoning, but that it's not the direct cause. It, it, will, it, will, it, will, it will poison the area which makes it fertile for an infection by the streptococcus, and the streptococcus then causes the disease. So just getting rid of mercury poisoning is not going to solve the problem um, if Fisher's correct. And I, he's a pretty good scientist, so that we need to, 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 to investigate this to see if, if bone, tooth bone, will tolerate any kind of a substance over a long period of time, or whether we have to realize that what we've got to do is just eliminate caries altogether. But once we have the caries, it, it just may well be if Fisher, Rosenau, Billings, um, and all of their associates, if their implications of their work is correct, once we have caries, we've lost the battle. Once it gets passed and into the dentin, Unless if there's a way we figure out to reverse it, to make it actually heal, then the, the, when we're better off extracting the tooth. And, and Fisher says, now extraction is no longer Boy Scout first aid. He emphasizes that this is, this, you've got to not just extract the tooth. Again and again, he comes to the point of we've got to <coughs> clean, out, clean out the system. So a couple other things that I'll mention, I'll try to wrap it up. The nervous system. Um, there was reference to the transmission of disease by neural transmission. Uh, Fisher disputes that. He said uh, others have looked at that. Rosenau thought that might be a possibility, but then they, they showed that it really is a bacterial cause. So, so they dismissed the neural transmission. Um, as far as the effects, I'm, I'm not really all that well read in terms of, of uh, neural therapy and so on. Um, uh, I don't know, I can't definitively say what the cause of the, the effects, the, the, the reactions are, but that the disease condition itself is being caused by a bacteria, and um, that's, that is a perspective that needs to be kept in mind. The, um, Fisher was very um, adamant about, uh, he was very cautious about injecting anesthesia. He 
felt that the, the, the problem is, is that the, uh, when you inject into, into already injured tissue that it could injure it more and cause a more severe infection. He was also concerned that, that, that the uh, anesthesia not be injected into a nerve because the nerve swells and this can strangle the nerve. So um, he did point out the, 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 the dangers of it. He recommended taking alcohol prior to injecting Novocaine as an antidote for it. Um, even beforehand, uh, referred to bone spicules from hypodermic anesthetic that has been linked to myositis. And um, so I thought that was um, uh, uh, worthy of mentioning. On some of the case studies, again, he had numerous case studies where rheumatism, cardiac problems, uh, uh, various diseases, post polio syndrome, uh, or the after effects of polio, which we now know as post polio syndrome chronic fatigue, other nervous system diseases, uh, chronic sinus disease, uh, that all of these were cleared up after the extraction of teeth. And there was a few cases there where he talked about a breast lump. The patient comes in, lump in her breast, she's chronically fatigued, uh, it, it did the extraction, cleaned out the, the, the jawbone, and the patient came back and said, well, doctor, the uh, how do, you, how do you feel? Oh, I feel much better. Well, how about the lump? Oh, that's gone. I guess it wasn't that important after all. Um, all of these things, I believe Dr. Meining mentioned this before, the, the women's diseases. Um, if you know anybody that gets a lump in the breast, send them to the dentist and get, those oral, get that oral cavity, get it cleaned out, get it, whatever it takes. So, so you got a couple of, and you don't want to put any, any permanent bridges in, you don't want to put uh, implants in, you're sticking something in that where you, you have what's called a locus of no resistance. You, you then have something that butts up against the bloodstream where the organisms that are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, they will, they will form a little nest there. You'll never know it because they've got access to the bloodstream and you still have these chronic disease problems. So uh, unless if you want to be on a, on a steady lifetime of antibiotics, uh, you, you don't want to have anything foreign in your body. You want to have... Uh, um, as, as uh, Dr. David Kennedy said, give me water in my water, and you want to have your body in your body. You don't want to have uh, other stuff in there. So now there were some particular case studies that I thought was really, were really interesting where he, he, he went back in. He did the operation, the extraction. The people didn't get, get better, but he went back in and, and ground the ridge off, and they all, they all cleared up. Uh, we're talking rheumatoid arthritis, uh, bladder symptoms, headaches, uh, rheumatic pains, hemorrhoids, um, and so on. Um, when he was talking about Rosenau's work, he said Rosenau went in and equipped himself with the tools of the dentist because the dentist was saying that there's no, no infection. And uh, uh, Fisher says denial of existence of infection by a dentist does not mean that none is present. So what um, Rosenau, he says Rosenau went and got the tools and went in and, and, and found infections where dentists said that there weren't. And, and uh, in referring to Rosenau, he said that sometimes a specialist never make a, uh, a, a basic contribution. He said sometimes uh, rank amateurs are needed. Well, I guess that's where I come in. I don't think he thought of a an amateur quite as, as rank as I am, but I, I like to think that um, I'm, a, I'm an amateur of the first rank. Uh, that would be a good place to stop. Let me just add a couple things here. Cholesterol, Fisher said that excessive uh, consumption of cholesterol is not a cause of disease and may contribute to it, but it, but it is not the cause. Um, and he, I've saw, seen mention that some people, uh, uh, some of the new work is mentioning that, that the cause of these diseases is capillary in nature. Rosenau talked about it, Fisher talked about it. It's, uh, you have little embolisms in the capillaries and then, then it, you, you, the, the area, uh, the blood supply is cut off and, and then you start to get your, your effects. So that is, um, that's uh, Martin Fisher. Last thing, Fisher said, well, maybe not the last, but pretty close. Fisher said alkalosis scarcely exists. I, 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 he said, uh, Fisher said that in the case of human being, the amount of carbonic acid produced daily is sufficient to neutralize two pounds of caustic soda, and such doses of alkali are scarcely to be anticipated in, in the cases of alkali poisoning. And so he said that alkali poisoning scarcely exists clinically. What is termed as such is intoxication with light metals, particular, particularly potassium and sodium. So this is something we may wish 
to look into. This does not dispute that when a, when a, when a body is, when you're, when you're compromised by disease, your, your body is going be, is, is to be out of whack. It's going to be out of balance. So whatever it takes to balance it. But, uh, and, and so that some of these measures that we have been discussing or investigating may be very, very appropriate in terms of getting that body into balance in the short run. But in the long run, what we have to remember is that it's, the, it's, it's, it's a disease process. The, 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 the organism, there's an organism that's causing this disease, and to really get your balance back properly, you want to get rid of that organism, and then you'll uh, get rid of the disease, we hope. Rank amateur in the first rank. I should have stopped there. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Any answers? Dr. Kennedy. Al and I disagreed on this, but my question is at what point have bacteria infected a tooth so much that it should no longer be filled but instead be extracted? And I gave you several examples. At any amount of decay, fracture or wear, which exposes them, B, deep decay within, say, a tenth of a millimeter of the pulse, three, non vital teeth confirmed by electrical pulp test, cold testing, drilling test, or four, teeth that have been exposed to the oral flora. Well, uh, this is, this is, this is fairly simple. We, we've talked about this. I, I think. The point that Fisher made was that if they can't heal, then we have no option. So the first, in the first instance, as he said, if, there, if, it's, if, if there's an, an infection, widen it out. Widen it out so you don't have things overhanging that the, the blood supply is cut out. Widen it out. Use very strong salt solutions. Flush with very strong salt solutions and try to get it to gloss over. Now, I really think that means also that we, because as Dr. Meining has pointed out, when you eat sugar, it gets into your bloodstream. It'll get there backwards. So you gotta, if, if you have somebody that has a, has a cavity, and I was talking to my daughter about this because uh, she had one, and, and it was a question of whether the tooth is going to go or whether she can try to do something with it. I said, well, from, from my understanding of it is you got to clean, clean out the infection, but you can't fill it. As soon as you fill it, it's never going to heal. Clean it out. Try to keep it clean. Don't eat any sugar. Don't eat any white flour. Just stay with like really fresh, fresh foods and see if you can get it to gloss over because we know in some minor superficial things that if you clean them off and you take care of it, they can gloss over. And if you can get it to gloss over, then basically you've got new enamel forming. The body will form new enamel if we can somehow protect it. We've got, you know, the more research has to be done. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hansen, we've talked about that as far as maybe the possible role of lasers and being very, the least invasive to clean out the infection. But, you, but if Fisher is correct, don't fill it. Try to keep it clean. Flush it with really strong salts. He discusses this a little bit more. And try to get it to gloss over. I'm not sure how much time that takes. Then once you gloss it over, you'll have a shorter tooth with enamel. Then you can build up on that. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. But it's, we, we don't know. And Dr. Meinig and I have talked about this as well. And this is where we really need to do some research. I'm just relating what the Fisher position is. And from a, from a physiological standpoint, it, the Fisher position seems to make sense. And whether you agree or disagree with that, I would really urge that you take a look at the book. He's, it's delightful reading. Fisher's a great writer, very wry, very clever, and, um, and very knowledgeable. Amen. Thank you. Good job. I liked it. I know. <laughs> That's your stuff. That's your stuff. Thanks. All right. Okay, we're going to have a wine and cheese party that's actually we started already, but it's obviously none of us are there. So I'm going to give five minutes to a friend of mine who is the inventor of the Cavitat. And he asked me not to brag about him, but he's a Vietnam hero, shot down twice as an F-4 pilot, was a Navy test pilot, flown just about everything that mankind has made. And I want to introduce my friend Bob Jones. Come on up, Bob. Just five, five quick minutes. And we can go drink and eat some cheese. No, uh, well, just to party a little bit.
tomorrow night we have a program. Yeah, c tell me what that is. Okay. You're going to speak tonight at the barnyard, right on uh, fluoride? Yeah, I'm going to talk to the uh, Monterey Dennis, uh, or the Wittigam, and uh, the local citizens of uh, Carmel on the issue of drinking water fluoridation. We busted their socks off in uh, Santa Cruz. We're going to do it again in uh, every other city in California and shove this fluoride thing right back up the state uh, uh, pools in Sacramento's nose. It's at 7 o'clock, and it's right over here, barnyard. barnyard. Right. Is that, is there a tonight or tomorrow or what? Tonight at 7 o'clock, it costs you 7 bucks. Uh, what is it? Is it it's a restaurant or what? Road. It's on Carmel Valley Road, and that's and the, the lady's going to pick me up and take me over there. It's coming over shortly, and the, we'll, I'm going to be here in the lobby. Uh, and we'll, if you want to okay. go, we'll probably have a car that you can get I'm going to put you on tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock sharp about Florida, okay? Can I give you a short talk tomorrow morning? <laughs> okay, and then you ought to hear Dr. Kennedy. You know, he's idea. Mr. Fluoride, so. Unless you're from Monterey, which you better get you better Thank you, Chris. The ones of you who have heard my lectures I've done on on cavitations and uh, ischemic osteonecrosis uh, uh, pretty well know how I stand on root canals. So I'm not going to get into a lot of stuff. Now I, I didn't uh, I didn't uh, volunteer to lecture this year, and I wasn't asked. But uh, when I uh, Chris called me up two weeks ago and said. Uh, Bob, I'd like for you to come on out. I think it'd do everybody good, let everybody know what's happening with the Cavitat, which is the instrument I developed to actually give us a 3D tomography on what is taking place in the jawbone. It's very accurate. The ones of the dentists, there's several out here that have used it. Uh, Terry Lee, uh, Chris Husser, uh, for two, and uh, Bob Kulak, where you are. Where are you, Bob? Bob, Bob has seen it work. Uh, and stuff. It's a very accurate measurement of, of what's going on inside the jawbone because we're actually getting a 3D model. But before I get into that, I'd like to, we just finished up a year's clinical trials with a cavitat from coast to coast, border to border. At a lot of conferences, a lot of do doctors and dental offices, uh, uh, Doug Phillips uh, kind of kicked the thing off down in Florida. He had me as a guest down there at his office. I was there three or four days and then over to uh, uh, Peter Holick's office at Sebastian, Florida, uh, a medical doctor that's, that's been converted completely into the uh, holistic uh, uh, treatment of this, this type of uh, problem. Now, I'd like to, everybody thinks I'm a serious person, and I am very serious. I'm very intense in what I do. I, 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 I'm a victim of, of bad dentistry myself, and uh, uh, damn near kill me, which the uh, Viet Cong couldn't do after uh, 258 <laughs> missions over there. They, uh, the ADA almost did it in. I, I got a, a lot of doctor friends and colleagues that are very, very influential in, in my life, and, and they, they've helped me uh, put my life back together after being in a wheelchair. And uh, I think the worst thing that's happened to me out of all this illness that's been caused from root canal teeth is that here's a healthy man that, that uh, at 45, uh, 46 years of age, I was running seven miles a day, weighed 196 pounds. And I never had a cavity. I had no fillings in my teeth until I was 42 years old. So, you know, it's not that I had periodontal disease or anything else. I had bad dentistry, really bad dentistry. It's a lot of things that have taken place in, in my life, but one of the beautiful things is, is meeting the, the fellow members of the academy that uh, have taken me in and, and, and shown me a, a lot of things, and I think I've, I've tried to repay back by by the invention of the Cavitat and, and, and being able to lecture on my experiences and, and what's going on around the, the world and what we're doing. And one of the things that we can throw a little humor at and things, I got a Skydish friend that told me here back when the Clinton scandal and Monica Linsky scandal broke out last year that, that it, was a, it was a very interesting case of uh, first year psychiatry in, 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 the, in the university. And I said, well, what's that? He said, it's body language. He said, we learn to read body language as much as we do the tone of the voice and everything else. And he said, there's one thing you can always remember. When somebody's trying to make a point and they're pointing a the finger at you, he said, if that finger's straight, they're telling you the truth. If that finger's curved, they're lying through their teeth. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> okay? Well, the ADA says, <laughs> the ADA says that mercury leaking, their words, leaking from silver amalgam fillings has been con proven conclusively by University of Kentucky study and the Nunn study does not contribute to Alzheimer's even though mercury is the, probably the trigger that creates Alzheimer's but dental amalgam mercury is different. 
I did. Okay. Ninety-two percent of root canals are successful. Well, I know, and you guys that are learning in this field know, ninety-two percent successful in producing systemic disease. They are successful. They're not lying there, but that's the truth. So anybody's trying to make a point to you, especially somebody like the ADA, and one of their officials or one of their dentists says this, I'm making a point right here. This is the way it is. That finger's curved. He's lying through his teeth, if he's got any teeth left. <laughs> but it's an interesting story, but it's, uh, it's been a fun year this past year. Uh, we got through with the clinical trials on the Cavitat, and I would like to report some of the things that we found, and you can take your notes down. These are facts. We scanned... 3,713 people. Now that's a little bitty study is what the ADA said. It's not a very good cross-section. And uh, by the way, I had lunch with the president of the ADA and the American Anodontic Society uh, president uh, in Virginia in June. And they, they notified me that if it, it I'd uh, subject to Cavitat to the American Dental Foundation uh, studies at Bethesda, Maryland for two months that they would endorse the the instrument in, in confirming ischemic osteonecrosis, they won't even use the word cavitation. But uh, that I had to agree to one thing, and that's not to sell to the fringe element. Sorry guys, I can't sell to you anymore. <laughs> but this, this is an interesting deal, and I told them, I said, the fringe element are the people that saved my life. I said, what makes you think I'd rather have 80% of the dentist with the ADA buy the thing when they don't know what they're looking at anyway? and not sell to the fringe element. So I got up and walked away from the, the luncheon and I was uh, feeling kind of low about everything, but I got to thinking about it, you know, well, there's an opportunity to sell 80% of the ADA dentists wouldn't know what to do with it if they had it anyway. But uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting deal. What, what we did in the uh, Cavitat clinical trials is ran a pretty broad spectrum of the human race on the America, on the U.S. planet or, or continent like we know it, from coast to coast, border to border. I don't know how many dental offices and how many doctor offices and how many conferences I was at, but we were working a lot of them 16 hours a day to scan the number of people that we went through. In fact, there's one day back in New Jersey, I think I put in 22 hours scanning people, and boy, I tell you what, you think that's not a job. But a lot of the conference, a lot of you guys that I've uh, ran across have been very good to help. Uh, I enjoy letting the dentist place the mouthpiece and run the instrument and, and show things. And uh, uh, I think a lot of you saw some things that you hadn't, hadn't seen before, and, and it sure, sure helped. And I want to thank all of you that have done that. And it took a load off of me. But the statistics are this. After 3,700 people that we scanned, over 9,000 scans, we scanned primarily root canal sites, wisdom tooth extraction sites, and molar extraction sites. Now we did do some incisors and bicuspids, but the biggest majority were in those deals. The numbers are, in all root canal sites, all of them, whether the tooth had been pulled or whether it was still in place, we found ischemic osteonecrotic bone, 100 percent, period. Okay, no matter what it's filled with, of those 66 of them, of those scans, the teeth were filled with calcium hydroxide. There's two or three trade names for them, and I won't get into the trade names on them, but they were filled with calcium hydroxide. So it doesn't matter what the tooth's filled with, you're going to produce necrotic bone. If you've got necrotic bone, you've got gangrene of the bone. American Dental Association is the only organization that is medically orientated in the world. It says you can leave gangrene in the bone and live with it. You cannot leave gangrenous bone in the mouth or in the legs or in the arms or anywhere else. It has to be removed. 85% of all wisdom tooth sites and extraction sites had ischemic osteonecrosis. 85%. If you've got the wisdom teeth extracted, which most of us have by the time we reach the age of 21, you, there, there's an 85% chance that you have got in at least three, 75% of the sites, ischemic osteonecrotic bone and what we call cavitation. Those are facts. 
Now that's something to think about because I know a lot of you out there, I see it in your faces, you've got, you've got a challenge to your immune system already and you've got root canal teeth or you've got wisdom tooth extraction sites and you're scared to death that, you're, that, that, uh, that this might be the cause but you don't want to do anything about it. You can't get well with those lesions in the bone. You cannot do it. Take the challenge off. I'm walking around now without any lowers except for five front teeth. I'm going to have some more pulled here in the next couple of weeks and cleaned out because the necrosis spreads and there's not much you can do about it. Because once the factors are there, they're done. Also this summer, one of our brothers, a doctor and a pathologist out of the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth metro area, Dr. Stacy Cole, good colleague and good friend, had just finished a cadaver study. He was doing study on the muscles that control the mandibular joint, trimandibular joint muscles and, and stuff. And, and since he's been doing cavitational surgery for about 19 years, he's one of the first original ones that was doing it. Stacy is a, an excellent surgeon, does good work. And he wanted to look at the uh, cadavers. We had 60 cadavers available to us for the study. And of that 60, there was 26 of them had died at before the age of 55, which we determined is an early age, of systemic disease. Now the, the crowning blow to the fact that all root canals are successful, every single one of them had a root canal or more than one root canal. Every one of them, pathology, pictures, tomography, everything we asked on it showed huge cavitations. All 26 died before the age of 55 of systemic disease. Some of the bones were worse than the bones that you see Jerry Bucco, I think Jerry talks tomorrow, were worse than the ones he uses on his pathology study. I have never seen it. I've got slides, and the next time I lecture, I'll show you and give you the pathology on everything that came off of these 26 cadavers. They are phenomenal. You won't believe the amount of destruction in the jawbone. Excellent pictures. And I didn't have time to get it all set up. I've got permission for from the from the hospital, uh, the med, med center, and also from Stacy to use these things because it is a very, very big advance in our cause of bad root canals. And Boyd Haley, from the University of Kentucky, who will be speaking tomorrow, has pretty well outlined the toxins and the damage these toxins are doing to the proteins and the enzyme systems in this deal. And I think as we get further into this science, it's going to be confirmed even more. So, uh, you know, think about what we're talking about. There is no such thing as a successful root canal except that that success is measured in death and disability. Period. So think about it. I'm going to talk about that right now. Coming up. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Cavitat, is, we're start, we'll be starting production on the production model of the Cavitat next month. In Denver, we're moving our, our complete operation out of Springfield, Virginia. And tomorrow, you will be able to pick up a package uh, from me or over at the table that has a purchase order, a letter of credit agreement, a, uh, a uh, lease uh, a credit application, and stuff in it. And as these are received back into us, uh, with a cover letter telling you what everything is, we will give you a serial number and expected date of delivery. So it should be available fairly quickly. And that's basically all I've got to say today. And I want to thank you for your little time. So.